The shrill ring of my cell phone shatters the silence of our dimly lit bedroom. I fumble for it on the nightstand, my heart already racing with late-night dread. Hello? My voice is hoarse with sleep. Brace yourself, Ava. Mimi's dead. Zack's words strike like a physical blow. She had an accident at home. Fell from the attic window while retrieving a box. The police are here. It looks bad. The room spins. I grip the phone, blood roaring in my ears. What? No, that can't be right. I just talked to her yesterday. She was fine. I'm so sorry, honey. I know how close you two were. Zack's voice cracks. I'm heading over to her place now. I'll call you back when I know more. Okay? Okay, I whisper, but he's already hung up. I sit motionless, phone clutched to my chest, as the news sinks in like poison. Mimi. Gone. It doesn't seem real. My eyes drift to the framed photo on my dresser, Mimi and I laughing at my college graduation last year, but her eyes bright with pride. She was more than a grandmother-in-law. She was my confidant, my cheerleader, the one who always believed in me, even when I doubted myself. Especially this past year, as I've struggled with the decision to go back to school and finish my accounting degree. Zack thought it was a waste of time and money. You've already got a job, he scoffed when I brought it up. Why bother? But Mimi understood. She looked me straight in the eye, her voice firm with conviction. You chase those dreams, Ava girl. Don't you let anyone tell you you can't. I'm so proud of you. Her words echo in my mind now, taunting me with the conversations we'll never have again. The milestones she'll miss. Liam's graduations, his wedding, the grandkids she'll never meet. Oh God, Liam, how will I explain this to him? At seven years old, he's already been through so much. Zack's gambling relapses, the money troubles, the fighting. Through it all, Mimi has been our rock. Liam adores her. I glance at the clock. 3.42 a.m. Zack should have arrived at Mimi's by now. Why hasn't he called back? An uneasy feeling stirs in my gut. Something's not right. I think back to his behavior this past week. The furtive phone calls taken in the garage. The late nights out with vague excuses. The fresh track marks on his arm he thought I didn't see. I wanted to believe his lies that he was still going to his Gambler's Anonymous meetings, that the missing money from our account was just a bank error. But now, in the harsh light of tragedy, I see the signs for what they are. Zack's relapsed. He's gambling again. And somehow I know with sick, sickening certainty it's all tied up with Mimi's death. I bury my face in my hands as silent sobs rack my body. The crushing grief of losing Mimi wars with the white-hot rage simmering in my veins. If Zack's addiction played a part in her death, I'll never forgive him. He'll have destroyed the one truly good thing in our lives. The phone rings again, startling me. It's a number I don't recognize. My pulse pounds as I answer. Is this Ava Laurent? An unfamiliar male voice. Yes, I manage. Who is this? Mrs. Laurent, this is Detective Novak with the Rosemont Police Department. I'm afraid I have some difficult news about your husband. The day of Mimi's funeral arrives, a bleak and chilly morning that perfectly mirrors the emptiness inside me. I stand in front of the mirror, robotically going through the motions of getting dressed. Black dress, black shoes, black veil, as if any of it matters, as if anything could ease the ache in my chest where Mimi used to be. Liam tugs at my sleeve, his big blue eyes swimming with tears. Mommy, I don't want to say goodbye to Grandma Mimi. I kneel down and pull him into a tight hug my own eyes stinging. I know, baby. I don't either. But Grandma Mimi will always be with us in our hearts, okay? We have to be brave for her today. He nods solemnly, his little face so serious it breaks my heart all over again. No child should have to deal with this much pain. At the funeral home, I'm barely aware of the somber faces, the murmured condolences. All I can focus on is the gleaming mahogany casket at the front of the room. Mimi is in there the woman who taught me how to bake apple pie and helped me pick out my wedding dress, the woman who stayed up late with me crying when Liam was colicky and Zack was off God knows where. I feel a hand on my shoulder and turn to see Jenna, Zack's sister. Her eyes are red-rimmed, her usually perfect hair disheveled. Ava, I'm so sorry, she whispers, pulling me into an awkward hug. I can't believe she's gone. Me neither, I murmur back, my voice thick with unshed tears. As we take our seats in the front row, I can't help but notice Zack's odd behavior. He seems fidgety, distracted, his eyes darting around the room like he's looking for something. Or someone. The service starts, a blur of prayers and hymns. 
When it's time for the eulogy, Zack takes the podium. I brace myself, wondering what empty platitudes he'll offer. But what comes out of his mouth shocks me to my core. Mimi was a wonderful woman, he begins, his voice trembling with what I now recognize as a masterful act. She was always there for me, no matter what, which is why it pains me to have to say this. He takes a deep breath, his eyes welling with crocodile tears. In the days before her death, Mimi confided in me that some of her most precious heirloom jewelry had gone missing. The antique diamond necklace her mother gave her, the ruby earrings from her wedding day, all vanished without a trace. Gasps and murmurs ripple through the crowd. I sit frozen, my mind reeling. What the hell is he doing? She was devastated, Zack continues, laying it on thick. Those pieces meant the world to her. She was planning to pass them down to her great-grandchildren someday. Now, they're just gone. He shakes his head sadly, a single tear rolling down his cheek. I promised her I would do everything in my power to find them. And I will. I won't rest until I bring her treasures home. It's the least I can do, after everything she did for me. He steps down from the podium to a smattering of applause, dabbing at his eyes with a handkerchief. I feel sick to my stomach. How dare he use Mimi's memory like this to paint himself as some kind of hero. As the service ends and people start to disperse, Jenna grabs my arm and pulls me into a quiet corner. Her face is pale, her expression grim. Ava, there's something you need to know, she says urgently, glancing around to make sure we're alone. Zack's been borrowing money again, a lot of it. From me, from our parents, from anyone he can con, my heart sinks like a stone. Gambling? I ask, though I already know the answer. She nods, her eyes filled with pity. He's in deep this time. Ava, I think, I think he might have had something to do with Mimi's jewelry going missing, and maybe even her death. The world tilts on its axis as the pieces fall into sickening place. The late nights, the lies, the way he couldn't even look me in the eye when he told me about Mimi's accident. Oh God, what has he done? The days after Mimi's funeral pass in a haze of grief and suspicion. I go through the motions of work and motherhood, but my mind is constantly churning with the sickening possibilities of what Zack might have done. I'm sitting at the kitchen table, half-heartedly picking at a sandwich when my laptop dings with a new email notification. I almost ignore it, assuming it's just another condolence message or bill reminder. But something about the subject line catches my eye. Open when alone. Zack's dark secret inside. My heart starts to race as I click on the message with trembling fingers. The email is from an anonymous account, no identifying information. But what it contains makes my blood run cold. Attached are several photos, clearly taken from a hidden camera. They show Zack rummaging through boxes and drawers in what I recognize as Mimi's attic. In one shot, he's holding up an antique jewelry box, a triumphant grin on his face. In another, he's stuffing something shiny into his pocket. Below the photos is a single line of text. Mimi had proof. Zack was stealing her heirlooms to pawn for gambling money. She was going to cut him out of the will. I feel like I'm going to be sick. It's one thing to suspect your husband of something so awful. It's another to see the evidence laid out in front of you as damning as a smoking gun. With shaking hands, I dial Jenna's number. She answers on the first ring, her voice tight with worry. Ava? What's wrong? I got an email, I managed to choke out. Someone sent me photos of Zack stealing from Mimi's house. They say she knew about it, that she was going to cut him out of the will. There's a sharp intake of breath on the other end of the line. Oh my God, Ava, I'm so sorry. I knew he was borrowing money, but I never thought. I have to talk to Mr. Erickson, I interrupt, my mind racing ahead. Mimi's neighbor, he might know something. Do you want me to come with you? Jenna asks gently. No, I say, my voice hardening with resolve. I need to do this alone. An hour later, I'm standing on Mr. Erickson's front porch, my heart pounding in my chest. When he opens the door, his weathered face creases with sympathy. Ava, he says softly, I'm so sorry for your loss. Mimi was a special lady. Thank you, I manage, my throat tight. Mr. Erickson, I need to ask you something. Did you ever notice anything unusual about Zack's visits to Mimi's house? His eyes narrow, a shadow passing over his face. As a matter of fact, I did. He was always coming and going at odd hours, looking over his shoulder like he was afraid of being seen. And he'd leave with his pockets bulging, like he was carrying something heavy. 
My stomach twists with dread. Did you ever tell Mimi about this? He nods grimly. I did. She confronted him about it, you know. Told him she knew he was stealing from her to fuel his gambling habit. She said she was going to change her will, leave everything to you and Liam. Tears sting my eyes. Oh, Mimi. Always looking out for us, even in the face of such betrayal. Mr. Erickson reaches into his pocket and pulls out a small flash drive. Mimi gave this to me the day before she died, made me promise to keep it safe in case anything happened to her. My hand shakes as I take the drive from him. What's on it? He shakes his head sadly. I don't know for sure, but she said it was proof, proof of what Zack did. I clutch the drive to my chest, a cold fury settling over me like a shroud. If Zack really did have something to do with Mimi's death, I'll make sure he pays for it. I'll make him regret ever laying a hand on our family. Thank you, Mr. Erickson, I say quietly. I'll make sure this gets to the right people. As I walk back to my car, the flash drive burning a hole in my pocket, I feel a grim sense of purpose take hold. I won't rest until I uncover the truth. For Mimi. For Liam. For the life we should have had. Zack's secrets can't hide in the dark forever. And when they come to light, I'll be ready. Back at home, I lock myself in the bedroom, my heart pounding as I insert the flash drive into my laptop. The seconds tick by agonizingly slowly as the video loads, my palms slick with sweat. And then there it is, Mimi's attic, dimly lit and cluttered with boxes. The camera angle is high like it's perched on a shelf. Mimi must have hidden it there, knowing what Zack was up to. I watch, transfixed with horror, as Zack comes into view. He's rifling through a trunk, muttering to himself. I turn up the volume, straining to hear, Where is it? Where is it? Come on, you old bat, where'd you hide the good stuff? Bile rises in my throat at the venom in his voice. How could he talk about Mimi like that? The woman who loved him, who welcomed him into her family? Suddenly, Mimi appears in the frame, her face etched with betrayal and anger. I knew it. I knew you were stealing from me. Zack whirls around, his expression morphing from shock to rage in an instant. You senile old bitch, you've been spying on me. I trusted you, Zack. Mimi's voice trembles, but she stands her ground. I treated you like a son, and this is how you repay me? By pawning my mother's jewelry for your gambling debts? Shut up, Zack snarls, advancing on her menacingly. You don't know anything about it. I need that money, Mimi. I'm in trouble. I know all about your trouble. Mimi retorts, her eyes flashing. And I'm done enabling it. I'm changing my will, Zack. I'm leaving everything to Ava and Liam. They deserve better than your lies and your addiction. Zack's face contorts with fury. He lunges at Mimi, grabbing her by the arms and shaking her violently. You can't do that. I won't let you. Mimi struggles against his grip, her frail body no match for his strength. Let go of me, Zack. You're hurting me. But Zack is beyond reason, consumed by his own desperation and greed. He shoves Mimi backwards, hard. She stumbles, her arms flailing for balance. And then in a sickening moment that will be seared into my memory forever, she falls. The scream that rips from my throat is primal, agonized. I watch helplessly as Mimi tumbles out the attic window, her body crumpling on the unforgiving ground below. Zack stands frozen for a moment, his chest heaving. Then, slowly, a look of calculated calm settles over his features. He moves mechanically, staging the scene, arranging Mimi's limbs, scattering a few boxes around her as if she'd been searching for something, erasing any trace of his presence, his crime. The video ends abruptly, leaving me shaking and nauseous. I can't breathe, can't think. All I can see is the look of pure evil on my husband's face as he snuffed out the life of the woman who loved us most. With trembling fingers, I copy the video file onto a blank DVD. Then, I compose an anonymous email to the local police department. I attach the video and type out a brief message. Zach Laurent murdered his grandmother, Miriam Erickson. The proof is in this video. Please bring him to justice. My finger hovers over the send button, a war raging inside me. Once I do this, there's no going back. Liam's father will be branded a killer. My family will be ripped apart by scandal and grief. But then I think of Mimi, of the light she brought into our lives, the way she believed in me when no one else did, the way she loved Liam with every fiber of her being. I think of the future she wanted for us, the future Zack stole with his selfishness and lies. I click send, a sense of grim satisfaction washing over me. Let the chips fall where they may. Zack made his choices. 
Now he'll face the consequences. And I'll be there every step of the way, fighting for the justice Mimi deserves. No matter the cost. The next few days are a blur of police interviews, hushed phone calls with Jenna, and sleepless nights spent staring at the ceiling, replaying that horrific video in my mind. I feel like I'm sleepwalking through my own life, numb to everything but the dull ache of betrayal and loss. Liam senses that something is wrong, his big blue eyes wide with worry every time he looks at me. I try to shield him from the worst of it, but it's hard when his father's face is plastered all over the news, accompanied by words like murder and arrest. I'm at the kitchen sink, mechanically scrubbing dishes, when I hear a knock at the front door. My heart leaps into my throat. I've been dreading this moment, knowing it was only a matter of time. I open the door to find two somber-faced detectives, their badges glinting in the afternoon sun. Ava Laurent? The taller one asks, his voice gruff but not unkind. I nod, my throat too tight to speak. We need you to come down to the station. It's about your husband. The ride to the police station is a blur of red and blue lights, my mind racing with a million terrible possibilities. What if they don't have enough evidence? What if Zack somehow talks his way out of it? The detectives lead me to a small windowless room, gesturing for me to take a seat behind a one-way mirror. On the other side, I see Zack, hunched over a metal table, his wrists cuffed in front of him. He looks haggard, his usually carefully styled hair disheveled, his eyes bloodshot and wild. A detective enters the room, sitting across from Zack with a file folder in his hands. He slides a photo across the table, tapping it with his finger. We have video evidence of you in Miriam Erickson's attic on the day of her death. Care to explain what you were doing there? Zack's jaw clenches, his eyes darting around the room like a caged animal. I was just helping her look for something. An old photo album, I think. I didn't do anything wrong. The detective leans back in his chair, his expression skeptical. Really, because the video shows you arguing with her, getting physical. And then, well, I think we both know what happened next. Zack's face drains of color. He shakes his head vehemently. No. No, that's not. It was an accident. She fell. I tried to catch her, but... But you didn't, the detective cuts in, his voice hard. You shoved her, Zack. You murdered your own grandmother in cold blood. I didn't mean to, Zack bursts out, slamming his fists on the table. I just... I needed the money. I owe some dangerous people, and they were going to hurt me hurt my family. I was desperate. The detective slides another photo across the table, this one of Mimi's broken body on the ground. And you thought the solution was to rob and kill a defenseless old woman? Your own flesh and blood? Zack crumples, his face contorting with anguish. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I never meant for it to go that far. I just, I just wanted to scare her, to make her give me the money. But then she said she was going to cut me out of the will, and I just, I snapped. I feel like I'm going to be sick, hearing the man I once loved confess to such a heinous act so callously, so selfishly, it's more than I can bear. The detective stands, gathering up the photos. Zach Laurent, you're under arrest for the murder of Miriam Erickson. You have the right to remain silent. As he recites the Miranda rights, I watch numbly as Zach is hauled to his feet, his head hanging in defeat. He turns to the mirror, almost as if he can sense me there. Ava, he whispers, his voice breaking. I'm sorry, please, you have to believe me. I never meant for this to happen. But I just shake my head, tears streaming down my face. You did this, Zack. You destroyed our family. And for what? For money? For your own selfish addiction? I turn away, my heart shattering into a million pieces. I hope you rot in prison for what you've done. Mimi deserved so much better than you. As the detectives lead him away, I collapse into a chair, my body shaking with sobs. It's over. The truth is out. But the pain is just beginning. The day of Zack's trial arrives, a blistering hot July morning that feels like a cruel mockery of the icy dread in my veins. I dress mechanically, my hands shaking as I button my black blouse, smooth my pencil skirt. Liam is staying with Jenna, mercifully spared from the media circus that awaits me at the courthouse. As I take my seat in the front row of the gallery, I feel the weight of a hundred stairs boring into my back. Curious onlookers, hungry reporters, all eager to feast on the sordid details of my family's implosion. Zack is led in, his wrists and ankles shackled, his once vibrant eyes dull and lifeless. 
He avoids my gaze as he shuffles to the defense table, his shoulders slumped in defeat. The prosecutor, a sharp-eyed woman in a crisp navy suit, stands to deliver her opening statement. She paints a damning picture of Zack's crimes, her voice ringing with righteous fury as she describes the callous brutality of his actions. He killed his own grandmother in cold blood, all for the sake of feeding his gambling addiction. He betrayed the trust of the woman who raised him, who loved him unconditionally, and he shattered the lives of his wife and child in the process. I flinch at her words, tears stinging my eyes. It's all true, every bit of it, but hearing it laid out so starkly, so publicly, it's almost more than I can bear. Jenna takes the stand first, her face a mask of pain and anger, as she recounts Zack's history of deception and theft. She holds nothing back, detailing every borrowed dollar, every empty promise to change. He bled our parents dry, and then he started in on me, always with some sob story about a business deal gone wrong or a buddy who needed bail money. I wanted to believe him. I kept telling myself, this time will be different. This time, he'll get his act together. She shakes her head, her voice thick with disgust. But he never did, because he didn't want to. The gambling, the lying, it was all just a game to him. And look where it got him. I'm next, my palms slick with sweat as I'm sworn in. The prosecutor leads me through the wrenching details of our marriage's unraveling, the toll Zack's addiction took on our family, but it's when she asks me about Mimi that I finally break down. She was the glue that held us together, I choke out through my tears. She was always there for me, for Liam. She loved us so fiercely, so selflessly. And Zack, he just threw that away, like it meant nothing. I turned to face him then, my voice shaking with rage and sorrow. She trusted you, she believed in you, and you killed her, Zack. You killed the best thing in our lives. He flinches as if I've struck him, his eyes welling with tears, but I feel no pity, no mercy. He made his choices. Now he has to live with the consequences. The trial seems to drag on forever, a parade of witnesses and evidence, each more damning than the last. But in the end, the verdict is swift and unanimous. Guilty. On all counts. The judge sentences Zack to fifteen years in prison, her voice dripping with contempt as she berates him for his selfish, destructive actions. You had every opportunity to turn your life around, Mr. Laurent, but instead you chose to betray and destroy the people who loved you most. May God have mercy on your soul. As the bailiff leads him away, Zack turns to me one last time, his eyes pleading. Ava, please. I'm sorry. I never meant to hurt you, to hurt Liam. But I just shake my head, my heart hardening into an impenetrable shell. It's too late for apologies, Zack. You made your bed. Now you have to lie in it. I walk out of the courthouse into the blinding sunlight, Jenna's arm around my shoulders. I feel hollowed out, scraped raw, but also, strangely, free. Free of Zack's lies and manipulations, free of the constant fear and uncertainty, free to build a new life for Liam and myself, far from the shadows of the past. It won't be easy. The wounds are deep, the scars indelible, but we'll survive, we'll heal, and someday, maybe, we'll even learn to hope again. A week after the trial, Jenna and I sit in the stuffy office of Mimi's estate attorney, the air thick with the scent of dusty law books and stale coffee. Mr. Harrington, a balding man with kind eyes, shuffles through a stack of papers, his brow furrowed in concentration. As the sole beneficiaries named in Miriam's will, you and your son Liam are entitled to her entire estate, he explains, peering at me over his reading glasses. That includes her house, her savings, and a sizable trust fund she set up for Liam's education. I blink back tears, overwhelmed by Mimi's generosity even in death. And Zack? I ask, my voice barely above a whisper. Mr. Harrington shakes his head, his expression grim. She made some changes to her will a few weeks before she passed. Zack has been completely cut out. He won't receive a dime. Jenna lets out a low whistle, her eyes widening. Wow, I guess she really did know what he was up to. I nod, swallowing hard. She was always one step ahead, even when we couldn't see it. Mr. Harrington slides a folder across the desk, his hand resting on top of it. There's one more thing. Miriam left a letter for you, Ava. She asked that you read it in private, when you're ready. I take the envelope with shaking hands, my heart clenching at the sight of Mimi's familiar handwriting. Thank you, Mr. Harrington, for everything. As Jenna and I leave the office, I feel a weight lifting off my shoulders. Mimi's final gift to us is more than just financial security. 
It's a chance to start over, to build a life free from Zach's toxic influence. I think I'm going to sell the house, I tell Jen as we walk to our cars. Too many bad memories. I want a fresh start for Liam and me, somewhere we can make new memories, just the two of us. Jenna nods, squeezing my hand. I think that's a great idea. And hey, with Mimi's house, you won't even have to worry about a mortgage. I manage a small smile, the first genuine one in weeks. She's still looking out for us, even now. That night, after tucking Liam into bed, I sit at the kitchen table and carefully open Mimi's letter, my heart in my throat. My dearest Ava, it begins, her handwriting shaky but still elegant. If you're reading this, it means I'm gone. I'm so sorry for leaving you and Liam so soon. I had so much more I wanted to teach you, to show you. But I know you'll be all right. You're the strongest woman I know. Tears blur my vision as I continue reading, Mimi's words wrapping around me like a warm embrace. I know what Zack did. I know the pain he's caused you, the betrayal you must be feeling. But I also know that you will rise above it. You have a light inside you, Ava. A resilience that cannot be dimmed. You will take this tragedy and turn it into triumph for yourself and for Liam. I choke back a sob, pressing the letter to my heart. I leave my earthly possessions to you not because you need them, but because you deserve them. You deserve the world, Ava. Never forget that. Take this gift and build the life you've always dreamed of. Fill it with love, with laughter, with joy. That's all I've ever wanted for you. The letter ends with a simple declaration, one that will stay with me for the rest of my days. I am so proud of the woman you've become, Ava, and I will always, always love you. Forever and always, Mimi. I fold the letter carefully, tucking it back into the envelope. I know I will read it again and again in the coming years, drawing strength and comfort from Mimi's words. She's right. I am strong. I am resilient. And I will build a beautiful life for Liam and myself, one that honors Mimi's legacy of love and grace. Zach tried to destroy us, but he failed, because the love we share, the bonds we forge, those are unbreakable. And in the end... That's what will see us through. Five years later, I stand in the kitchen of Mimi's house, now our house, watching Liam as he does his homework at the table. At 12 years old, he's the spitting image of his father, with the same dark hair and mischievous grin, but he has Mimi's kind heart, her gentle soul. Mom, can you check my math? He asks, sliding his notebook towards me. I want to make sure I got it right. I smile, ruffling his hair. Of course, baby, let me take a look. As I scan the neat rows of equations, my mind drifts to all that's changed in the past few years. True to my word, I sold the house Zach and I once shared, using the proceeds to pay off our debts and start fresh. I went back to school, earning my accounting degree while working part-time and raising Liam. It wasn't easy, juggling classes and homework with PTA meetings and soccer practices. But every time I felt like giving up, I'd think of Mimi, of the strength and resilience she instilled in me. And I'd keep pushing forward, determined to make her proud. Now, I have my own accounting firm, a thriving business that allows me to provide for Liam and still be there for all the important moments. I even found love again with a kind, gentle man named Eric, who works in the same office park as me. He's everything Zach wasn't, honest, dependable, selfless. He loves Liam like his own, and he makes me feel cherished, respected, whole. Looks good, kiddo, I say, handing Liam back his notebook. You nailed it. He grins, his chest puffing with pride. Can I go play video games now? I laugh, shooing him away. Go on. You earned it. As he scampers off, I start preparing dinner, my mind wandering to the letter I received from Zach last week. He's up for parole soon, and he wants to see Liam to try to make amends. Part of me wants to tear the letter to shreds to banish him from our lives forever. But another part... The part that still remembers the man I once loved, the father of my child, that part wonders if he's changed, if prison has truly reformed him. I'm still mulling it over when Eric comes in, his face lighting up when he sees me. Hey, beautiful. Something smells good. I smile, leaning into his embrace. Just spaghetti and meatballs, nothing fancy. He kisses my cheek, his arms tightening around me. Fancy or not, I'm sure it'll be delicious. You're an amazing cook, Ava. I blush, still not used to such easy affection, such open admiration. I learned from the best. Mimi taught me everything I know. At the mention of Mimi's name, Eric's expression softens. He knows all about her, 
about the incredible woman she was and the legacy she left behind. He even helped me hang her portrait in the living room, a constant reminder of her love and guidance. She'd be so proud of you, you know, he says softly, tucking a strand of hair behind my ear. Of the life you've built, the mother you've become. You're an inspiration, Ava. Truly. Tears prick my eyes at his words, and I lean my forehead against his. Thank you. For believing in me, for loving me, for being the partner I always dreamed of. He smiles, his eyes crinkling at the corners. It's easy to love you, Ava. You make it easy. As we sit down to dinner, Liam chattering excitedly about his day, I feel a sense of peace wash over me. This is what Mimi always wanted for me, for us. A life filled with love, with laughter, with purpose. I glance at her portrait, her eyes twinkling down at me. Thank you, I whisper, my heart full to bursting. Thank you for everything. And I swear, just for a moment, I feel her presence, warm and comforting, guiding me, even now. I turn back to my family, to the beautiful life we've created together. And I know, without a doubt, that no matter what the future holds, we'll face it together. With love, with strength, and with the unshakable bond of family. Just like Mimi always taught us.